Doggy fighting machine is tamed into a tranquil kayak. Agility tips from a world champion. And how does Lily get the inhabitants of Lizardville to behave so well? Find out now on Animal Attraction. Too sweet, does that feel good? Just relax. <laughs> Welcome to Animal Attractions TV. I'm Megan Blake and this is Toot Sweet and we're enjoying some quality time together. Toot Sweet enjoys his massage. Cat massage is good because it deepens your bond and increases their blood and lymph circulation and it can actually lower both of your blood pressures. Start with your fingers on his jawline with a deep scratching motion. Then move to the ears in a circular motion. Acupuncturists say that there are pressure points in the ears and this can actually help with organ function. Then move to the spine and with your thumbs go up the spine and around the shoulder blades, paying close attention to the muscles between the shoulder blades and underneath them. Then move to the chest and grab some of that loose skin in front of the shoulder bone and pull this chest skin tight and scratch across the chest. Then switch hands, grab that skin and then scratch across the chest. Go back and forth and your kitty will just love it. Cat massage also helps you locate any lumps or bumps or anything that doesn't belong there so you can always keep your cat in tip top shape. Here at Animal Attractions TV we're all about sharing information and expert advice to help you and your pet have a great life together, including what to do when everything seems to be going wrong, like in this next story. But not to worry, Coach Ronald White, our pet trainer 911, to the rescue. Bentley is totally insane. He jumps on the furniture, he jumps on people, he chews up everything, he is loud, he's obnoxious. You know, Bentley will actually jump over the couch and he'll sometimes swipe people's heads when he does it. A lot of his behaviors are annoying, but some of them are actually dangerous. You know, he's gotten into prescription medicines and eaten the whole bottle. Um, and we've had to call the veterinarian dozens of times. And he's also caused a fire in our kitchen before. He jumped up on the stove and turned it on when there was pizza up there and the pizza box caught on fire. I can't even go outside with my girlfriend, Amber, and have a cup of coffee in the morning without Bentley jumping on us. Ow. Hot. Are you okay? Yeah. Can you believe that? We need to get him trained, honey. Well, my girlfriend Amber uh, is friends with Ron from years back. When we decided to get Bentley trained, she mentioned Ron as a uh, as a really good trainer, and so we gave him a call. How you doing? I'm Ronald White. Hi. How you doing? Come on in. You got a beautiful home. Thank you. Well, you got this nice backyard for them dogs? Yeah, it's nice. So which one is the bad dog? That would be this one here, Bentley. Oh, okay. Do you have that list we had you to make out? Yeah, it's right here. Oh, okay. Okay, he's what, jumping around the house? Yeah, he jumps up on the furniture. He jumps up on people. Now, what about when he attacks the other dogs? Yeah, what happens is whenever Rocky wants to go outside, uh, Bentley waits out there, and when he tries to go outside, he bites his neck. They got to do with him wanting to fight him, be aggressive? Yeah. Uh, they, they're not playing. No. Oh, so he, he's dominant. He wants to be the leader. I'm going to take your dog home for 30 days. Okay. And then when I'm done training, I'm going to train you for seven. Okay. And each time I come here, when I leave, the dog leaves, because now I'm training the family. Sounds good. And you'll see when your dog comes back home, He'll be well trained, he won't be grabbing your other dogs, and he won't be starting fires in your house. Sounds good to me. I'll take him now. Okay. Come in. Okay. Come on, let's go. Bye, Bentley. So when you got three male dogs, there's gonna be a problem about dominance. <laughs> Who's the boss? <laughs> so that's what the one dog was doing. He was establishing his place with the other two. He's the boss. They didn't know that they was 
headed for a big problem as the dogs got older. Because then, when they get older, two and three years old, there ain't no plan. They just run around there just fighting each other. First, I knew the dog had to go through some obedience in order for him to learn the commands. Well, since he's never been trained, I trained him to walk on the side of me, to sit, down, stay. Sit, down, stay. Come here, come here. I go towards my furniture, and I won't say anything. I want to see if he's going to respect it. Come here, time out. Time out. That's his couch. Uh, once he has the basics down, I'll take him put food somewhere and he'll get up there and get it and I'll give him a little tug and I'll say the word, leave it. Leave it. I want him to know it just like he knows his name. So I won't use his name. And then I'll drop something in front of him and if he goes down to smell it, I'll give him a tug on his lead and tell him to leave it. Leave it. So I put him in different situations where he hear the word, leave it. Leave it. Leave it. Leave it. And once he learns that word, leave it, and he respects me, I knew that I had to uh, let him get along with the other dogs. You get the toy? Here, here. And so what I did, I took him out of the yard, I let the dogs that I had here in boot camp around him to play with him. But I'm the dominant dog then. I'm the leader of that pack that he's in. And if there's a scuffle going out there between two dogs, I'll just go out there and say, leave it. Hey, Wobble, leave it. Where I won't have to reach down there and get hurt. Did you see him bully him? Leave, hey, 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 what I tell you to? You leave it. You see, that's what you do at home, huh? You gotta get along. But when you go home, you'll stop messing with the other ones. That's a good boy. That's a good boy. Okay. When I seen that he was getting along with the other dogs, I knew that it was time for him to go home. I hope your owners do as well as you did. After we train the dog, we work on the owners. When Ronald first showed up, it took stop. me uh, several Sit. minutes before I believed that it was even my dog. Are you ready to see the basics, what we put him through? Absolutely. He, uh, you know, told sit him to down. sit and to lay down and to stay. Stay. I stretch my lead out. And there was even a cat that was walking around outside in the front yard. And when Ronald said, leave it, Bentley wouldn't even make eye contact with the cat. Now I'm going to train you how to do this. Okay. He taught us all the commands that Bentley now was able to follow. And he also showed us how to maintain the training so that Bentley wouldn't forget it. You. Continue to tell him to have the command, he'll stay trained. He asked me about what one of my dream scenarios would be, um, having a perfectly trained dog, and I told Ronald that I'd like to be able to ride in my fishing kayak with the dogs. And to my surprise, he said he'd be able to train them to do that. Come on, let's go. Come on, come on, come on. Good boy. Come on. That's a good boy. Bentley, uh, never been swimming. He was nervous at first, but then I built his confidence up. He came right into the water, and it was fantastic. Come on, let's go out. Let's go. Good boy. That's a good boy. Come on, let's do it again. Come here. He's a swimmer. Come on, let's go out. I trained him how to get in the kayak and sit there while I move through the boat, move the boat. I think I'm going to get me one of these. Then I got out and I put him in the water, in the kayak, and moved him around the water. And he just stayed right there and he liked it. And I knew that he was ready to go. You got your obedience down. You kayaking. Oh, Henry's gonna be happy. You know that? Come on. Here he comes. Here they come. Oh, who's that? How you doing? You did Welcome great. Home. There you go. It is nice Thank to bring you. a dog home that oh. learned how to get along oh, with other dogs did, and to behave. And not only that, he learned how to kayak. And you gotta see this one, what we did with him on the kayak. You're gonna see it's unbelievable. That's awesome. That's exciting. At first, I was a little worried that Bentley wouldn't be able to ride in the kayak with me. I was afraid that he, uh, he might jump out into the water, so okay. I was a little nervous. Stay. Okay. Keep saying it. Stay. After Ron spent, you know, a couple hours training him, it was amazing. Put him in the kayak, and he sat right there and took the ride. And I told Henry to try to do it every day with him if he could, or once a week, but take them kayaking with him. Because now they have structure. Yeah, the water's nice. Come here, Rock. Come on. It didn't take long for us to get used to Bentley's training. 
he was able to follow the commands right away and uh, just it takes you know daily upkeep but it's definitely worth it. Have you seen any fish? Oh yeah they were jumping earlier. Maybe we can cook out later on the grill. Sounds good to me. Having a big dog is amazing you know we go outside and play fetch and we go swimming. He's a great companion. You guys want to go ride in the kayak? But the most exciting thing for me was being able to go fishing in my kayak with Bentley as a sweet, loving dog. Life is good. We all know there are countless ways to have fun with your pooch. Allie and I often like to come to dog parks just like this one. It has over 15 acres of natural surroundings shaded jogging trails, two swimming pools, big lauded areas with shading trees just for lounging around, and even a little doggy shower to wipe off those muddy paws. But the best part, here, Allie, she can run free, off leash, just a dog being a dog. She's in dog heaven. Maybe you and your dog prefer more challenging activities. Well, then you should meet Stuart and Patty Ma, who have both been members of the U.S. International Agility Team. Stuart has been a nine-time USDAA national finalist and was inducted into the International Agility Hall of Fame. Together, they have trained six national champions and one triple crown winner. Basically, these guys are the best when it comes to dog agility, and they're going to show us some ways that we can get started with agility, too. The thing that makes agility the most fun for the dog and the owner is the fact that the dog and the owner work together and they're always together working as a team. The handler learns to read the dog and learn how to communicate with the dog much more effectively than any other dog sport. The tunnel is one of eight basic obstacles that you see on an agility course. It's the easiest one to teach you, which is why we actually teach the tunnel first by actually taking it and scrunching it up completely so it's a very, very short tunnel. And what we do is we put a, what is known as a target down on the other side of the tunnel. Ready, go, let it go. So the dog sees the cookie or the toy and the dog can usually go through a very, very short tunnel. As we do that, we do what we call a process of back chaining where the, we actually lengthen the tunnel out some so it gets longer and longer. Go, 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 go. Yay! Once the dog learns how to go through a straight tunnel, the last step is to teach the dog to be able to go through the tunnel when it's bent. And that's the hardest one to do because um, the dog doesn't always see the exit. The dog learns a couple of things. Number one, it learns a lot of confidence and to be able to do things without having to see things completely, especially in a bent tunnel. And the other thing is to get, have confidence in the handler that he won't send him into a situation that's undesirable. Weepholes are probably the hardest obstacle on the agility course to teach, but they're also the most flashy to get the dog to do it well, which is why we also back chain and use targets for the weave poles. In training the weave poles, we also use what we call a channel method, where the weave poles are actually split apart sideways. And what we do, we put the dog in the channel at the end, let the dog go to the target, and gradually back the dog up through the weave poles until they're running through the channel itself. As we teach the dog how to go through the channel, we gradually move the channels in closer and closer as the dog starts weaving. All right, you ready? Go, 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 go. Get him, get him, get him, get him. Yeah, good girl. Teaches the dog not only rhythm and balance, but coordination and timing. If you look at the A-frame, um, there is a yellow zone on the bottom of each side. The dog must be able to touch both the left or the right or the back of the front yellow zones in order to be able to consider having done the A-frame successfully. Some of the A-frames can range up to six foot three in height, and that's a pretty steep angle for a dog to climb if it's not fit. So um, it has to be fit, it has to be not overweight, and it has to have some sort of you know, regular training regimen besides just doing agility. The teeter-totter is probably the most complex of the three contact obstacles. It's the one, not only do they have to touch the yellow on the front and the back, but it also moves. 
and that's what's very difficult for the dog because it doesn't, they don't always know exactly when it's going to move. So the dog has to really, really understand what this obstacle is and how it moves and understand what it does in order to be able to do it well. So to do agility, a dog doesn't have to have really formal obedience training. In fact, this dog right here has had really no formal obedience training. Um, all he did was the basic stuff about sit and stay and not run off. He ended up as a, as a world-class you know, competition agility dog. Even if you're not successful at a world-class level, what, it, what you gain from it is being able to spend time with your dog and being able to bond and be closer with the dog and understand what the dog is thinking about and, and the dog understands what you think about. So even if you're not doing agility in competition, I always say do it just for that reason alone. But um, any dog can do it and I encourage any dog. I've seen chihuahuas and I've seen Great Danes do it. So you know, it doesn't matter what type of dog you have, if they're enthusiastic enough they can do it. Ah, counting sheep is so relaxing. For me, it means it's time for a nap. But for this breed, counting sheep is strictly business. Today, we're meeting the ultimate blue collar dog. And I'm not just talking about his neckwear, I'm talking about his work ethic. This is a border collie. What kind of jobs will he do? Well, herding and driving sheep are number one on this breed's resume. But he'll herd anything from sheep to ducks to kids. That's all they want to do is, is work from uh, when they get up in the morning until they go to bed at night. In fact, if my dogs go two or three days without work and they start getting kind of crazy and, and uh, have a cabin fever sort of thing. Not only does he love to learn obedience and agility, this breed takes quickly to search and rescue, narcotics and bomb detection, plus can make an excellent guide dog. He even excels at frisbee competitions, anything to make him feel useful. The Border Collie is, is similar to the postman, uh, come rain, snow, sleet, or hail, they're going to do their job. And they, they could care less whether it's raining, or whether it's sleeting, or whether it's snowing, or whether the sun's out. Uh, you just got to adapt to their environment because they're going to get out there and do their thing, and you got to get out there and do it with them. Border Collies like Kate are renowned for their supremely high intelligence, strong work ethic, and very high energy level. Border Collies can be prone to certain eye and hip problems, so you're going to want to investigate the breeding line thoroughly before adopting one of these. As you can see, Kate's not very happy about being inside. She was bred to be a working dog, and she'd much rather be in the field herding sheep. The Border Collie is built to work. They make quick turns, they move fast, they think fast. Their gait should be a smooth one so that they can move and they can make their turns. Um, if they're constructed right, they have no problem working all day long, all day. You need to take them to the park and throw the frisbee to them, uh, take them on a, a, a run with them, do uh, dog agility. But besides the exercise, they need the mental stimulation of having something to do. A bored, mishandled border collie can get into terrible trouble and, and be incredibly destructive. If they want to get out, they're going to figure out a way to do it. They'll even learn how to open uh, gates, to turn door doorknobs. Border collies are generally very people friendly and they're also uh, uh, very eager to uh, please their, their masters. We enjoy our dogs and they're very much worth all the effort that we have to put into them. Uh, we get back much more than what we put out, I feel. Uh, we really love our dogs. So if you're looking for an athletic partner with limitless enthusiasm, who will work long and hard just to make you happy, then consider the Border Collie, the down-to-business dog you can count on. If you are intimidated by the prospect of trimming your pet's nails, you really shouldn't be. With a few simple guidelines, anyone should be able to do this at home. Unless, of course, you've got a really crazy pet. You'll need a good quality clipper, and it's worth spending the extra few dollars because if it's dull, it puts too much pressure on the nail and can be uncomfortable. There's no pain involved with trimming the nails, as long as you don't cut them too short. Your job will be a lot easier if your dog or cat has clear nails. 
it's easy to see the pink triangle at the base of the nail where the sensitivity and blood vessels are located. So you want to cut about two millimeters or more beyond that area. Dark nails are more challenging because you can't see this area. What I tell people is to look at the shape of the nail. Find the point on the underside of the nail where it changes direction. You want to cut beyond that point. The alternative method is to cut small pieces at a time until you see a change on the inside of the nail. It looks like a pink or gray circular area that is a different texture. Also, hold the scissors perpendicular to the nail to prevent splintering. And don't forget to trim the dew claws. These are the nails that are located above the paw on most dogs. Don't feel bad if you see a little blood. This is only mildly uncomfortable and even professional groomers will occasionally quick a nail. There are products available to stop the bleeding, but if you don't have any of these available, a little pressure with some cornstarch or baking soda will do the trick. It's okay. And one last tip. Start trimming your pet's nails early and make it part of your routine so it never becomes an issue. There you are. Oh, darn! Oh, gosh! Come here. Where did you go? I give up. They're just too fast for me. And I'm not talking about doggies or kitties. Nope, I'm looking for a more exotic kind of pet. Lizards. I know they're not for everybody. But here's a story about a young girl named Lily who's turned lizards into a fashionable alternative as well as a money-making enterprise. Welcome to Lizardville. I like to catch and hypnotize lizards. <laughs> After I hypnotize them, I'll dress them up and then put them in sets like in beach chairs or on horses. And then my dad takes pictures of them and we make greeting cards and t-shirts and limited edition prints. I started catching lizards when I was about three, and I started catching lizards because I saw these little brown things running around, so I was like, hmm, what are those? So I decided to catch them, and these are Cuban anoles. I usually find them sunning on a tree or on the ground, and how I catch them, I usually sneak up from the back, and then I go behind the tree or behind a rock, so they can't see me and then I'll cut my hand over the lizard and then I have it and then that's how I caught it. You can't like squeeze it but you have to lightly grab it so you don't hurt it but you also have it secure so it doesn't like run away or jump. <laughs> When I was little, I thought lizards were really interesting and since they were alive and they can move and like have expression, so I decided to dress them instead of dolls. I discovered how to hypnotize lizards because I saw this lady, she was hypnotizing an alligator by rubbing its belly and then it, it got relaxed, so I tried it with the lizard, and it worked. You have to hold it behind its jaw and around its stomach, and then with your pointer finger, rub it down its belly for about five to 10 seconds, and then it'll stay asleep for about 30 minutes. I'm not really sure like why that happens, and uh, it's still a mystery. I get the clothes from, like, toy stores, and they're just doll clothes. So when I got older, my dad and my mom started taking pictures of the lizards in the sets. And then we showed the pictures to some of our friends, and they thought it was really funny and that we should start a business with it. So we did. And now we've started a business called Lizardville. We're going to have to get some more smaller sizes since we're getting a lot of requests. Right? Yeah. Okay. 
Before the picture actually gets taken, we have to set up all the props in order so it makes a good picture. And then once we set up all the props, I hypnotize the lizards and dress them. And then I set them there and then we have the photos. Sometimes when I'm working with the lizards, they'll wake up while they're in the clothes or while they're sitting down. And once they wake up, they'll sort of be shocked and then they'll try to get out of the clothes or run off the set and then I have to catch them again and set them back up. When I hypnotize the lizards, it doesn't hurt them, it relaxes them. And if it did hurt them, I would never do it because I love all animals and I have pets and I take good care of them and I, I would never hurt anything. When I'm playing with lizards, I'll catch them and then I'll play with them. And I always let them go. I never keep them for over a day. I don't think I'll ever stop being friends with the lizards. I think I'm never going to be too old for the lizards. And that they're always going to be my friends and I'm always going to play with them. fun and you'll be happy to know that I've gotten much better about catching reptiles. See? <laughs> Although I don't think Jewel here is going to be happy about dressing up. We're so glad you stopped by today and hope you had as much fun as we did. And remember you'll find all kinds of interesting stories and insights 24-7 on our website at AnimalAttractionsTV.com. I'm Megan Blake and on behalf of everyone here at Animal Attractions TV, we'll see you next time. Right Jules? Thank <laughs> you.